All right, so I'll start off by introducing myself. Um, my name's Rachel Starry. I am the Digital Scholarship Librarian at UCR Library. I'm still fairly new. I just joined UCR in, um, in March. Um, so um, we have, uh, again, links on the slide here to access this slide deck because there are clickable links throughout, um, as well as our shared notes document where you can ask questions and introduce yourself. Um, and that will be available um, for the foreseeable future for reference after the fact. Um, all right, so I did want to start by acknowledging um, that these are really challenging times. Um, I want to acknowledge that the pandemic and other structural inequalities have disproportionately affected people of color, particularly black and indigenous peoples. Um, and of course, as members of the UCR community, we stand with Black Lives Matter against racial injustice, police brutality, and other human rights violations. Um, we also recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air the Kauia, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, um, as well as their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. And while we're now currently meeting in digital spaces, um, I invite you to learn whose ancestral lands you're physically located on if you're not calling in from Riverside. Um, and there's a link here if you're interested in, in finding out more. Um, so I did want to just acknowledge this, you know, and for this workshop, um, we're all in different spaces. Do what's best for you, engage any way you feel comfortable. I'm available after the fact if you have additional questions. Um, in fact, my uh, contact information is on this slide. Um, again, welcome to folks who are just joining the call now. Um, and I said before we got started, before I started the recording, that um, this is an intro to DataViz workshop, um, which could be, I mean, a hundred different workshops. There's a lot of things we could theoretically talk about today. Um, and I, I really like to make workshops hands-on, and that's a little bit more challenging in this virtual format when I know you know, if you're using a mobile device or a tablet or something, it might be hard to have these slides up and watch me walk through a tool and do it at the same time or have another browser window open. Um, so I'm trying to make all of the resources available in multiple ways, depending on how you're calling in today. Um, and um, we'll be talking about a couple of different topics. Um, if there are additional topics that would be of use to you all, I would love to learn about that. So share that in the Google Doc or in the chat. Um, and definitely feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, but today, some of the topics that we're going to be talking about are um, getting familiar with the process of selecting a chart type. Um, that can be something that trips a lot of folks up. Um, there's also limitations in different tools, right? Like if Excel is only telling you you can make these 12 different kinds of charts, um, it might be you know, confusing as to, well, when do I use these different charts? Or um, you know, are there other, when you encounter other kinds of charts in other software, you know, I wanted to kind of demystify that process a little bit and talk about you know, chart types that are appropriate for certain kinds of purposes and data. Um, we'll also look at a particular tool, and again, it'll be more of a demo than a hands-on um, you know, workshop, just because of the format. Um, but um, all the things we'll talk about today, except for the data wrapper demo, are software agnostic. So regardless of whatever tool or you know, even kinds of data that you're working with, if you're using Excel or Sheets or um, you know, online uh, tools or Tableau or, or you know, whatever it is, data visualization, you know, tools you're using or programming languages, um, these principles should apply and be helpful, or I hope they will be. Um, and um, I'll also um, kind of focus on color and accessible design, because um, that is another thing that is just generally um, important to think about as we're designing visualizations. All right, so before we kind of dive into those detailed topics, I wanted to take a step back and, and think about this question of what do we mean when we say data visualization? What are the different activities that we engage in when we're visualizing data, right? So I really like Cole Neusbaum and Netflix. Um, she's the author of Storytelling with Data. Um, her analogy for these kind of two different activities, these two different purposes of visualization, right? So there's the process that you go through when you're exploring and making sense of your data, especially if it's not data that you created or compiled or whatever. Um, or, you know, you have questions about your data, you have hypotheses you want to test out. Um, that whole process of exploratory data analysis and visualization, um, and her analogy is like, you know, sorting through a hundred different rocks just to find the one or two gems, those, those patterns that, those interesting um, relationships or things that come out um, that are of interest to you um, for whatever reason, right? And on the other side of that, once you come to, you know, you have those one or two gems, interesting pieces of information, how do you communicate or make an argument with a chart effectively 
and then share that information. Um, tell a story about that data with your audience. So um, the kind of classic example of why we do um, exploratory data visualization um, is Anscombe's Quartet. So if you're not familiar, this is a, um, a stable data set or a series of four different um, you know, tiny data sets created by uh, a statistician in the 70s um, to illustrate how important it is to visualize, to plot data as we're exploring it. Um, so in this, um, in this uh, data set, um, three of the different sets have the same uh, values in the X variable. Um, and in fact, the summary statistics, which is one of the very first ways that we kind of dig into and get a high level overview of a data set, um, a lot of the summary statistics are the same, right? So the X, the mean of X in all of these is nine. Um, the mean of Y is 7.5 in all of these. Um, the sample variance of X in all of these is um, 11. And then the linear regression, the correlation is, is the same. So there's a lot of things that get hidden with those summary statistics. But then as you see on the right, when you plot these, you see outliers, you see the different distributions of the data. Um, so if you're interested in, in digging into this more, um, I have links to these um, sources just on Wikipedia. And then on the far other side of things, right, um, folks use infographics using design to kind of enhance the um, visualizations that you know, we make to share information and make it understandable, but also memorable, right? You want someone to be able to look at the charts that you make and very quickly understand your point, understand what you're trying to convey with that chart. Um, and then you can, if you want, you know, use design to aid in them, making them understandable or memorable or draw people in. Um, and we'll come back to look at this pie chart a bit later. Um, honestly, there are things that I would do about this to make it clearer. So um, this is like a catchy title, but I think chart titles really should convey the main point of the chart, right? So you actually have to read this text to find out what is this pie chart showing me, um, literal pie chart, um, that it is about uh, data from a 2012 NPR survey about preferences for Thanksgiving, right? So you could make this chart type something like, chart title something like um, apple pies, you know, King or something, you know, like to convey that that's what this chart is about um, for Thanksgiving. Um, yes, as I said, we'll come back to that and we'll be thinking about this kind of, what is your purpose? Exploring or explaining um, throughout this morning. Um, but um, I wanna shift over to that question of how do you choose a chart type that's appropriate for the kinds of data, for your purposes, for all of that. So I have a couple of things to consider um, and I wish that this, um, you know, that purpose, you know, exploring or explaining that there was some kind of magical, um, you know, two buckets that charts just kind of fell into if you're trying to explore your data, like these charts are great for exploring and these charts aren't. Um, but really there's kind of, it's a mix. So in terms of purpose, um, I would generally recommend starting with simple, um, simple charts and then charts that are just really, um, really appropriate to the kinds of variables you're wanting to see the relationship between, right? So for exploratory data analysis, um, I mean, there's no reason why you can't use a more complex chart if that is the kind of chart that's going to really visually give you insight into what's going on in your data. Um, when it comes to explaining, we'll talk a lot about accessible design um, later on. Um, and there are a lot of principles and kind of factors you want to keep in mind as you're um, choosing chart types to use to convey information because sometimes um, a chart is really great at visually conveying, um, you know, summary information. If you're familiar with that chart type, then it becomes kind of a barrier. How do I even read this? So then you're not conveying the information, right? So there's a lot to kind of keep in mind. Um, and we'll talk about design a bit later. Um, but primarily, um, the main limiter on what chart type is going to be a good choice. Um, has to do with the kind of data that you are working with. Um, so if, um, if you have text data, um, say you have one text variable and one numeric variable, you're going to have a certain subset of charts that are available to um, plot the relationship between those two variables, right? Um, if you have more than one numeric variable that you're trying to compare to each other, um, a different set of charts is going to be good for that. Um, of course, if you're working with, you know, network data, nodes and edges, we actually just did a, a network analysis workshop last week. Um, I can share the link to the recording of that if anyone's interested, but network data is fundamentally different or differently organized. 
of course, geospatial data brings its own issues, time series data, also called um, panel or longitudinal data in different disciplines. All of those are going to impact the kinds of charts or maps or tables or whatever um, are available and appropriate for um, visualizing. But really, there are a couple of things that I think are the most important in um, limiting or um, you know, pointing you to charts that would be good for you to use in particular circumstances. Um, and that is primarily, um, well first, how many variables do you want to visualize at once? Um, because different charts are able to um, analyze or, or visually convey um, and you know, display different numbers of variables, right? So a histogram, um, which of course is just the representation of the distribution of one numeric variable, that's the one on the left here, um, that's, you know, only appropriate really, I mean, you could theoretically use it for more than one variable, but it really is showing the distribution of, um, you know, different values and the frequency of those values, how many times does, you know, a value occur in a sample um, over one variable, right? Whereas on the right hand side here, a scatter plot, it, you know, requires two variables. You can't make a scatter plot without two numeric variables, um, one for the x and one for the y axis. On the other hand, Another thing to keep in mind is that whether your data or your variables are um, sequential or categorical is going to also limit or point you to using particular chart types. Um, so again, on the left, um, and I guess I should define this as well. So sequential data is also called continuous or continuously varying data. Um, and it's the most common type of numeric data. Usually if you have numbers, you, you most likely have sequential um, a sequential variable, right? Um, so sequential data lies along a smooth continuum, right? Imagine the numbers from zero to a million or zero to uh, or all real numbers, whatever. Um, so histograms and scatter plots, as we saw on the previous slide, both require sequential data. They really can't represent categorical data, which is also called discrete or qualitative data. It's usually text, but it doesn't have to be. Some numbers can be categorical. Um, and it's basically, you know, where the values are broken up into different classes or categories, right? They fall into different buckets. So as opposed to histograms, um, right, which show continuous data distributed across intervals or time, um, bar charts, as we see here on the right, which look really similar to histograms, like technically they're, you know, they're related, um, but bar charts are generally used to display um, categorical data, right? So how many instances of a value in different categories versus the distribution of a sequential, you know, series of numbers. And if folks have questions, again, I'll be, um, just to keep things moving, I'm going to kind of like pause and check the Q&A in the Google Doc every now and then. Um, so um, I will pause in a moment um, to check out questions. Um, but before we, we pause for questions, um, the last kind of thing to keep in mind, and this is what we're gonna spend some time on in the next few minutes, is um, also what type of pattern do you want to show, right? Because different charts are able to show different kinds of relationships between variables. So um, you might want to compare two different numeric variables. You might want to see the proportion or distribution or comp composition of you know, within one variable. You might want to investigate a part to whole relationship. That's you know probably the only time you'd want to use a pie chart, right? Where you, your numbers add up to 100%. Um, you might want to investigate hierarchy or change over time. All of these have different chart types associated with them that are, you know, superstars for that particular type of pattern. Um, and the um, tool that we're going to look at today um, is um, from Data to Viz. There are a lot of different data visualization catalogs out there. Um, I can share others if folks are interested, but this is the one we're going to look at today because it kind of um, it does a great job at walking you through. It's actually a flow chart. So let's go on over there. Let me double check that we're, I'm not missing a whole bunch of questions so far. Good, good. Okay, but keep adding questions if you, if you have them. So From Data to Viz um, is a website that um, basically allows you to um, choose the most appropriate chart types for your data, and they have this amazing flow chart. And again, um, there are different all these different factors that go into selecting a chart type, right? Um, and this is not just your entire data set, right? If you have network data, you're kind of limited to this, right? But a lot of tabular data is going to have a combination of numeric, um, categorical, um, and they're using numeric as a, as a synonym for sequential here, um, or sequential and categorical. 
And we're actually going to, um, if we look back over here, I have some sample data sets we can look at today. So we're going to um, start off by looking at this kind of classic data set. I love it. Um, it's data on, I think, 32 different um, cars from the 1974 US Motor Trend magazine. It's just all kinds of aspects on um, the car design and uh, consumption um, and performance, different things. Um, and then the other data set that we'll look at in a bit um, is population data from Gapminder. Um, but first, let's hop over to MT cars. All right. So um, just to illustrate like what I mean by all these different kinds of variables, if this is still kind of a new area for you. Um, so we have this, this column here, this variable um, for model, different models of cars. And this is text, right? So it's going to be categorical data, even though um, it's, you know, each observation is only one instance of each car in this data set, right? Then ostensibly all the rest of our data is um, numeric. Although there are a couple of these columns where things like the number of cylinders a car has, in this case, the values in this column are only four, six, or eight cylinders, right? Um, same with gear. Cars only in this data set, I think, have three, four, or five gears in their transmissions, right? So those technically, while their numbers, are categorical variables, right? So we have a mix. We have a mix of numeric and categorical. So let's go back over and say we want to I have a question. I have, you know, I have an assumption that, you know, um, of course, this is obvious, but that, you know, miles per gallon is related to the number of um, cylinders a car has, or that miles per gallon is related to the number or the horsepower that a car has. Um, obviously, it is. Um, so if I want to, say, um, compare or evaluate the relationship between this numeric um, variable um, miles per gallon and this categorical variable cylinders, we can go back over to from data to viz and we can select um, the appropriate place to start in our in our adventure to find a chart type to visualize these two variables. So I have numeric and categorical. Um, and we have one numeric and one categorical, right? We could have one categorical and several numeric um, or several categorical and one numeric. So we're going to start over here because this is what we have. And also they have these fantastic kind of little um, helpers, helper di uh, dialogue boxes that pop up. So if you're, what does it mean one observation per group, right? So we have one numeric variable, MPG, and one categorical variable, cylinders. Um, do we have one observation per group or several observations per group? And this is essentially how many, you know, does um, for our um, categorical variable, does it appear multiple times? Um, or does it appear just once? And in this case, right, we have lots of cars with four cylinders. We have lots of cars with six cylinders. So this occurs more than once. There's more than one observation for this um, group, right, for, this cate for different categories. So this is going to be the list of things that we want to use to investigate. Um, so we could um, use the um, histogram, we could use the box plot. And for any of these, if you're not clear on like, I've never used a box plot before. What's fantastic about this particular resource is um, they have pages and articles. They also have what are called data stories for each of these different kinds of charts and different, you know, kinds of combinations of variables and things. So they give you information on um, the, what each chart is good at doing, what it does, Right, what um, a little breakdown of what it actually um, means, like, you know, what are these lines and, you know, what, is the, what the box is actually showing us. Um, they link out to, to, if we actually go to the dedicated page for box plot, it's a whole, a whole page just about box plots. Um, it, it gives you all kinds of summaries of what it is, an anatomy, a breakdown of this, you know, that these are outliers, etc. cetera. Um, and um, what I really like um, are that they kind of highlight Mistakes that it's easy to make using this kind of chart, right? <clears throat> as well as recommendations. So they say, maybe you want to order your box plot by median. That can make it more insightful. So they give you kind of tips and tricks for using this particular kind of chart, um, as well as if you happen to be generating your charts in R, Python, or JavaScript, they give you um, links to examples in each of those that are generated by each of those language, 
languages. Um, and in fact, all of the charts on this particular website are generated in R. Um, so there's all of that information for each of these different kinds of charts. Any questions so far about um, that? All right. We can also look at a different data set to um, walk through that flowchart again. Um, so this data set um, is actually a combination of datas, different data sets from um, Gapminder, which is a nonprofit, I believe in Sweden, somewhere in Northern Europe. Um, and they have all different kinds of open, um, open data that you can um, reuse and explore. Um, they also have different tools for investigating and um, you know, exploring data. Um, but the, the data set that I have for us today is a combination of a couple of different data sets from in here. It's um, you know, population data. Let me go over to it. Um, so we have information for each country. And they have, I think, 198 countries, 197 um, in their data, set, data sets. Um, and for each of these countries, we have information on income per capita, this data set's from 2011, um, life expectancy information from 2016, population, and of course, Excel is doing that thing where it doesn't display us the numbers, um, and um, also which region, and these are, um, like this, there's a lot more information you can get from Gapminder, this is just a sample, um, so, um, Yes, so in this data set, we have um, a couple of text variables, right? So, um, and this one is uh, really truly categorical in the sense that, you know, each of these occur more than once. So we can um, group our countries by region. And we also have several numeric, um, numeric variables. So let's see, if we wanted to, um, if we wanted to, um, follow the flowchart for um, um, region and um, population, that would mean we have one categorical variable again and one um, numeric variable. Since we already did that, let's not do that. Let's actually, what if we wanted to compare um, income per capita to life expectancy? Is, um, is uh, income, is, is, is the wealth of different countries related to health outcomes? And of course the answer is yes. Um, so we want to compare these two different numeric um, variables. Imagine that we didn't know that and wanted to walk through that. Um, we'll actually go back over here. And again, we want to go to the numeric end. Um, sorry, we want to go to just numeric because we have two numeric variables, right? So again, you get to just walk down this flow chart. Um, how many variables do you have? We have two. And again, it asks us, are they ordered or are they not ordered? Um, so in our case, our data is not ordered, right? Um, neither of these variables are ordered. So we have, um, again, another decision to make. Um, they ask us, do our data, does our data have um, many points? Um, and they, they draw the line at 2,000 you know, observations. Um, because it's really easy for certain plots, like a scatter plot, to get overcrowded, like over, you can plot too many points to the point where someone can't visually look at that chart and understand it because there's just too much data um, that you're trying to cram into that one chart, right? So certain charts um, are better for um, displaying lots of different data points than others, right? So we could use any of these to kind of compare the, um, in fact, we don't have that many points, right? So we could use one of these. We could use a box plot again. We could use a scatter plot. In fact, a scatter plot is what we will be using when we go to data wrapper, um, and we'll be graphing um, the relationship between the variables in this Gapminder data set in data wrapper. So we will use a scatter plot, but we'll actually modify a scatter plot and layer on additional variables, which we'll see a bit later. Okay. Um, not seeing any questions. So we can um, move from chart types, which we'll again revisit when we talk about, um, when we go to look at data wrapper, and move into um, color and accessible design. Because if um, this is another area where I feel like folks get, um, can get tripped up um, and you're also limited by the software that you're using, right? So if, if Excel gives you a bunch of pre-populated color palettes, you're probably going to choose from that, right? That's, that's what's readily available. Um, so it's really easy to not be deliberate in our color choices 
Um, but it's also really easy to mislead with color. Um, it's easy to make charts that are that don't print, right? You might make a chart on your computer and the color palette, they're all um, really similar um, in value, right? And when you print it in grayscale, it's an illegible chart. Um, and there's also, of course, color, folks see color differently. So it's important to keep that in mind. And um, there are lots of tools out there now to help us um, uh, kind of um, see how um, different color palettes are going to appear to people with different color vision deficiencies, for example. But before we get to that, um, just backing up a bit and like kind of establishing a baseline about color and charts, right? Because this can be really confusing. I'm gonna use this word palette, color palette, um, I think a bit too broadly, because when we're talking about color and charts, we're actually talking about two different things. Um, so we are talking about color scales, which are the color gradients that we want to use for sequential data. And then color palettes are explicitly, um, you know, different colors, like the rainbow palette, for example, for categorical data. Um, and this is, and it's important to draw this distinction for a couple of reasons. So let's look first at color scales. So a color scale is um, just a gradient. Um, and I don't want to get too much into like color theory, but there's um, a couple of terms that we'll be using um, that I think it's important to define. So color, as we like talk about it, color values um, are made up of three things, right? They're made up of the hue, which is the actual color, right? Blue, a hue is more blue or more red or more yellow. Um, and then saturation, which we don't care about as much in this particular context, but that's how intense a color is basically. Um, and then lightness, which we do care about. So we care mostly about hue and lightness. So a gradient is, um, and you can have a single hue, right? So a gradient is just varying lightness values within a single hue or within multiple hues. So in this case, our gradient goes from light blue to dark blue, right? Just one um, angle on the color wheel. Um, you could also do multi-hue. This is really common as well. So you can have a gradient that goes from say yellow or green down to blue. Um, so you'll see these, um, these used a lot as well. So let's go ahead and look at an example. So coral fluff maps really commonly use um, gradients, right, for sequential data because a lot of times, and, and that's the thing too, you decide kind of um, where the delimiters are within your gradient um, and that can be a point that can be used to mislead in charts if you're clustering, you know, a lot of uh, the values within one, um, one of the color values and not spreading them out evenly. Um, that can be a way to lie with a chart, but this is basically, um, you know, an example of um, sequential data um, being used, population data really commonly, um, temperature data, things like that, heat maps um, on core plot maps. So we're using this gradient, the single hue gradient. Um, There's another kind of sequential um, data color scales, and that is the divergent scale. So um, this is where you use two different gradients that are separated by some meaningful midpoint value. So this is only useful if your data does have some kind of meaningful midpoint. Um, the common or the kind of like um, case, case book example or textbook example is um, for political data, right? So 538, um, you know, they have, you'll probably have seen lots of these different kind of, um, you know, voting maps where color is used to indicate how strongly a part, or, you know, a region in the country is going to lean one direction or the other for our two-party system. Um, and of course, um, for things like that, it's important to pick colors that are meaningful, right? So it would be, it would make no sense for, since our political parties do have colors affiliated with them to not use that in our data biz, right? So that's an obvious example. Um, but it's also, um, it's possible if you have a heat map, right, that's separated, you know, you have like really hot values and very cold values, you could use green and blue. Um, and again, we'll come to talking about color blindness um, and accessible palettes and scales because sometimes you'll not want to choose, um, for example, red and green, because folks that have um, different kinds of red green color blindness, those two gradients are going to look very similar to them, right? That's what uh, sequential or diverging um, color scale is. It's just two gradients separated by a mid value. Categorical data, on the other hand, requires us to use palettes, um, which are <clears throat> um, a selection of different 
um, different colors and ideally very different colors. Um, and by color, I mean hue, right? So different hues, but also different um, values, lightnesses or darknesses of a color. Um, and um, it's a balancing act. And um, I should say the images that I've been using for these slides come from a really fantastic article on the Adobe blog by Alan Wilson. So I'd recommend reading that for more information on this particular topic. Um, but when we're choosing color palettes for categorical data, um, we want to choose um, colors that are the most different from each other possible so that when you're looking at one data point, you can immediately tell right, that that's different, a different um, you know, value than other data points in different categories, right? Um, so it's, it might be tempting to create a palette like this where we're using adjacent colors on the color wheel. Color wheel. This is very um, aesthetically pleasing, but it's also pretty bad for data viz because these colors are really similar, right? So someone might look at this and not be able to tell the difference between these two blues or between this blue and the purple. They're too similar, right? So it's not very usable. On the opposite side, we could um, vary not just hue, but also um, value or lightness or darkness. So here we're seeing that they're selecting, you know, a light value of this hue. They're still using adjacent hues, um, but it's also not very usable because these dark values um, are really difficult to tell apart. So ideally you want to use um, colors that are very different from each other, separated around the color wheel but also different in value. Um, so for example, and we'll see this in um, the tool that we're gonna use in a second, all of these are very, apart from yellow and maybe orange here in this, um, in this example, they're all very similar in lightness value, right? So if we print this in grayscale, we're not gonna be able to tell the difference between blue and green and red, probably. Um, and that brings us to this tool, which I wanna spend a few minutes exploring it is a fantastic resource for selecting color palettes. I think I also had an example. I had an example for color, categorical color, just to demonstrate why this is important. And this is, there's like a million different color pickers out there on the internet. Um, we'll look at a couple in a second with this palette. But basically, um, you don't want to use sequential color scales, right, a gradient for categorical colors, because this is a, this is totally useless, right? Um, it's really impossible to use this key, the legend, and refer it to this data and tell the difference. Um, it would also not be great for um, accessibility purposes. Generally, if you're using, um, you know, categories, you want the categories to be different colors, very different colors in terms of hue and lightness. So this is a much better example. Okay, so this palette is a fantastic resource um, for selecting um, color palettes, they give us three, they link out to three different places to create, um, to generate color palettes. Um, you can also edit um, the colors directly in here. Say you bring in a color palette from Excel and you're just curious, you know, how accessible is that color palette? Um, are there any problems with it? Um, this was built for using um, JavaScript. So it's really um, kind of got um, web accessibility in mind, but you don't want to use, for example, when you're programming um, or creating palettes for the web, like colors that have similar color names. So if we scroll down um, to the bottom over here, we get this color report and um, we want different color names. So there's two magentas in their sample color palette and that's bad for web design. But um, in general, what, we're, what we care about more in terms of creating accessible color palettes or scales for our charts is over here on the left. Um, this tool will tell you for the colors that you that you bring in that you, you tell it to look at. Um, are there any colors that are difficult to tell apart as lines or small points, um, as different areas on a chart? Um, and it gives us this, um, it's, it's sample, um, gives you sample visualizations to kind of imagine how this particular palette or scale is going to look for different kinds of charts. And that matters, right? Because if we have large blocks of color that are sitting right next to each other, that might make it um, easier or more difficult to tell them apart than if we had, say, really thin lines on a line graph or points. And sometimes it's really hard for small points to distinguish one color from another, even if they're very different, right? Um, and also, yeah, it depends if you know whether, like where and how your charts are going to be displayed. If you uh, have full control over, like my chart's only going to appear in this particular context, like on my website or in a print publication, 
then you can kind of tailor your color choices for that, um, that publication or sharing context. But sometimes you're not sure, right? Someone might um, take an article and print it out. In that case, you'd really wanna make sure that your color palette's gonna work for a grayscale. Because if you choose a color palette with a lot of similar um, you know, lightness values, even here, um, some of these are gonna be really difficult to tell apart. And again, you can scroll down and get the report. So we have two, these light grays that are gonna be virtually um, impossible to distinguish even in large areas, right? Um, so we're going to want to change this color palette around so that these values and these values and these values are different enough, especially if you know that your chart's going to be printed in black and white. Um, it also will, um, for any color palette that you bring in, uh, simulate the, uh, what it might appear to folks with um, different kinds of colorblindness. And they're actually limiting it to just red-green colorblindness, which represents a larger portion of the population. Um, so deuteranomaly, protonomaly, um, these are where um, green looks more red, red looks more green, um, or protonopia and um, deuteranopia, and I'm not sure if I'm you know, pronouncing those 100% correctly. Um, but those are where red and green are virtually indistinguishable. So you can use this tool to simulate, are these values different enough for folks with these particular kinds of um, colorblindness? And again, scroll down and it will tell you there's you know, some colors in here that are they're really similar. They're both kind of blue, right? Even though in your original palette, this one is purple. Um, so that's really useful for creating palettes that are um, a bit more accessible. Um, and again, you can choose palettes with a couple of these, these different tools from a JS. It calls itself a palette picker, but in reality, they only let you create scales. You can create a sequential or a divergent scale, which again is gradients. Um, I like this particular color picker because it has um, tritinopia or tritinomaly, which is a blue, blue yellow color blindness. It makes um, folks with this particular color vision um, have trouble distinguishing between yellow and pink and purple and red and blue and green. Um, so it's important to kind of keep that in mind. So um, this, and again, when something says this palette is colorblind safe, like that's, that's a judgment. They're using some algorithm to determine how that these colors are different enough. Um, but in fact, uh, it is um, better than not simulating it and not um, making the attempt to make the colors different enough for people with different color vision. So this is great. It will tell you that, you know, for example, um, this value is really similar in lightness to this value, um, which is pretty common for divergent color scales. Um, but this could be a problem for printing in grayscale, for example, because this value is very similar in lightness to this value. So when you strip away the hue, it's going to be the same gray, um, et cetera. So if you wanted, you could just like um, copy and paste these values over into VizPilot and then hit replace. And then it's going to pop in those colors here. And then you can run through what we just did, kind of comparing um, how they would look on different kinds of charts, um, going down and checking, okay, these are all being categorized as pink. That's not great for web design, um, but there's not really any color conflicts. They're different enough in terms of um, values and things. Color Brewer does more than just um, Scales, Color Brewer is, um, it has um, single gradients, um, including both multi-hue, like yellow to green, yellow to blue, right, purple to pink, um, as well as single colors, divergent scales, and they also have palettes, right? So we could click on this color palette here, which is a really commonly used rainbow palette in, um, when you're creating data viz in R. Um, I, don't know, I don't think it's the default, but it's really close. Little lag there. We'll hit replace. And again, we can kind of check if, you know, is this a good palette for different kinds of um, color vision? Is it good for grayscale? It really is not. There's a lot of values that are really similar for grayscale, um, et cetera. And you can get your colors out if you make changes to them or you want to grab these colors from um, in a different format. You can use this tool to translate between hex values and RGB, right? I think. The vast majority of data viz platforms are going to let you bring in colors or select colors in one of these two formats. Um, this is a different format. I guess it's probably more common in web design, hue, saturation, lightness, but hex and RGB are really common. Okay, 
So that's Viz Palette, a uh, fantastic tool. I use it. Um, any, let's see, are there any questions? At this point, we have a lot of tabs open, so I'm going to close some of them. Ah, yes. I will definitely make sure to add links in here to everything. Um, and you can get to the Color Brewer site from this link right here on Viz Palette. Um, I'm not sure what, which GitHub um, is being referred to in this question, but again, you can get to all of the, um, the different palette pickers from Viz Palette right here. So you can get to Chroma JS right here. You can get to Colorgoracle is another really fantastic one that allows a lot more fine tuning of hue and saturation and lightness values. So um, you can use these links within this palette to get to all of those different color pickers. Um, yep. Awesome. All right. Okay. So before we move away from color and start thinking about um, other aspects of accessible design, um, there are a couple of things that um, we would want to consider in addition to the things I'm kind of like mentioning as we're looking at these different tools, right? So all of these are actually taken, created with data wrapper. So we'll see um, in a minute this, um, all of the images and the slides coming up are from uh, their Chartable, which is the blog, the data wrapper blog. Um, so this is a great post on uh, that, that data wrapper has produced on creating or choosing colors. Um, so the very first thing, you know, that you want to think about as you're creating color palettes Thanks so much, Margarita, for sharing that link in the chat. Um, so the very first thing is, again, do you need a color scale for sequential data, or do you need a, cat a categorical color palette, right? And this makes a huge difference. Um, so if, if we have um, people in two groups, we don't necessarily need a, a scale for that, right? A, a categorical palette would be better and much easier to distinguish. Um, additionally, if you need to use more than seven colors, and seven's kind of an arbitrarily picked number. Um, there's been different kinds of research done on how many colors can someone, a human, distinguish on average when looking at one, you know, one chart or picture. Um, and it's generally somewhere in the ballpark of seven. Basically, the fewer numbers of colors you can use on a chart, the better. Um, the more readable it's going to be for more people. Um, but if you need to, use, if, if for example, you have so many different categories that you've got a chart like on the left here you definitely want to consider using either a different chart type. So instead of using a stacked bar chart, which is on the left, you could use a divergent bar chart, um, as we're seeing on the right, um, comparing to different values for each of these different categories. Um, then you don't even need color, right? Um, or you could consider aggregating your data into fewer categories. Um, it's also really important, especially if you are, if you have multiple charts that you're using to, you know, explain something, um, that you consistently use the same colors for the same variables, right? It's very confusing to readers if you, um, you know, for example, switch up the colors that are associated with particular um, values. So here, you know, if you switched from using blue for one country to blue for a different country, that's very confusing. You'll want to just keep it consistent if you can. Um, across multiple charts. Um, another very useful thing to kind of think about is that gray can be um, the most powerful color in data viz. Um, and you'll see charts a lot like this in data journalism, um, more and more in um, kind of academic publications um, to call attention to particular um, like trend lines or particular you know, data points in your chart you can um, choose which, um, you know, which of the, and this again comes back to, this is explaining, this is explanatory visualization, right? This is not the chart that you're going to be using. This might be the chart that you're using just for yourself to understand, well, okay, what are the different, you know, variances and, um, you know, relationships between these different, these different lines? Um, you know, oh, I'm going to want to investigate this orange line because it has, you know, the massive, like, high point for this, whatever. Um, and again, you can do this in a data wrapper. You can choose particular um, lines to call attention to. Um, and again, um, when we get to data wrapper, we'll see that it's interactive. Um, so you can also hover over charts. So it makes charts like this more usable if they're interactive. But again, if you don't control, if someone's gonna print out your chart or not, or encounter it in a static format, it's better to not you know, create charts like this, assuming that they're going to be interactive and work 
on everyone's you know devices or whatever um, it's better to do something like this and use gray if you can um, it's also really important to follow established standards so for example um, people expect dark values to be used for uh, or dark colors to be used for high high numeric values right so if we have a chart um, we're going to start by looking over here because this is what to do instead of what not to do, right? And we can immediately tell. We are, we are trained um, after looking at charts like this to know that Texas and California and kind of Florida and kind of New York have higher population just at a glance. We can really easily see that. If we reverse that and we can tell that there's low, right? There's, because light colors are just naturally associated with where they have been, you know, we've been socialized to understand that they mean low values. If you flip that, it's going to be very confusing for people and this chart is virtually unreadable um, just by that simple flipping of the gradient to make, you know, high, the lighter color. And this is true, especially if you're using a multi-hue um, sequential scale, because um, it's easy to be like, I have a scale that goes from yellow to purple. Um, in that case, you would definitely want the yellow to be, the, to represent the lower values and purple, which is just naturally a darker hue to represent the high values. If you flip that, you're going to get this situation and it's going to be really confusing for your readers. Okay, um, and let's just double check. Are there any additional questions? The color palette site will give me the code in R. So the from data to viz, oh no, the link disappeared. I'll, I'll get it back. <laughs> Um, the, from data to viz will give you um, the code in R. Um, if you're talking about viz palette, Color Brewer is um, Color Brewer is used really commonly in R, but it, it's not going to give you R code for a chart. It's just going to give you um, the hex values for the colors. Oops, sorry, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll relink that in this document. Oh, thanks. Someone got it. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, um, so moving from color to just general principles. And I know it's hard to think about general principles without um, really concrete examples. So I have examples for each of these. Um, and these are just kind of four principles, design principles that um, based on all kinds of different research has shown are, um, will make your charts more readable to more people. So um, in general, um, Simplicity is a principle to strive for, right? So if you can plot fewer marks um, on your charts that you're sharing with other people, um, that's better, right? It's generally best to have as few data points as possible so you can avoid, you know, kind of unreadable spaghetti graphs as these kinds of line graphs that are unreadable are sometimes called. Um, and in general, if you can convey your point with a more familiar chart type, that's generally preferred, um, but that's being said, you don't want to shy away from um, less common charts that just happen to convey information really, really well. Um, and it looks like we have the time, so I'm gonna go ahead and click over to this example. Um, so this is a chart created by a faculty member that I worked with at my previous institution, and they originally had a, it wasn't a pie chart, it was like a donut chart, which is a pie chart with a center cut out with lots and lots of different colors um, they're investigating the relationship between um, different um, musicians and the publishers that printed their music in first edition, right? So for Beethoven, there's all these different publishers. So originally he had a, um, imagine a pie chart with all of these different colors, very difficult to read. This is called a Sankey diagram, um, which is not a common type of chart, right? You might look at this and be like, I've never seen anything like that before, but it actually conveys this information really well, right? So for Beethoven, and he can add additional you can add additional columns and variables in here and like it will split the flow out differently. So we could group these publishers by country. You could add country as an additional variable in here and it would still be very readable, very legible, right? Um, and this is made in, in R and Shiny. Um, so that's, um, it's like you don't need to shy away from using kind of uncommon um, graphs if they just happen to be really, really good at conveying information, right? So another example um, from this um, Tableau blog post is about alternatives to pie charts. Um, I used to, I've walked my stance back a bit. I used to say net pie chart, never ever ever use pie charts. Um, and that is because the human brain is not good at judging angles. 
or area, right? We can't look at a circle of one size and look at another circle of another size and say, oh, you know, they are X percent different. Um, we're very good at determining lengths of lines, um, the human brain is. So it's better in general to use lines than it is to use length of line um, than it is to use area or um, angle alone. So instead of like these pie charts all look exactly the same, right? Um, but if we change to using a um, dumbbell chart, um, we're actually going to see a, um, it's more visually apparent the differences between these different percentage values, right? Especially in comparing across the different charts. So don't shy away from using an uncommon chart type if it's really good at conveying the information. But simplicity is generally best. Okay, in addition to simplicity, context is really, really important, right? So you want to use really good, clear, descriptive text in the titles of your charts, in the captions, um, just generally in all the text that you're using to contextualize your chart, right? Someone should be able to read the title of your chart and know what your chart is showing us. Um, and it's also really, really important if you are um, sharing images of any kind, including charts and tables and maps, um, when those images or charts appear online, um, you always want to have a quick summary of your chart in the image alt text um, so that folks who are using screen readers or, um, for example, if your chart doesn't show up, right, you have a blog post and people are scrolling through it and for some reason the chart think that the link is broken and the image can't appear, the alt text will be displayed, right? So even if your chart's not there, everyone will be able to say, oh, this chart was going to show us, you know, this particular relationship. Um, yes, so pretty simple, provide some context. Um, the third principle is legibility. Um, so generally, and this is true, this is actually very Western centric of me to say, but horizontal text is more readable. And that's true for like languages that type in horizontal text. So for Latin text, which is what this workshop is being delivered in, um, horizontal text is more readable than vertical or, you know, text on an angle. You'll often see bar charts with like vertical text, you know, labels. Um, or slanted text labels, try and, if you can, make um, for, you know, um, Latin, Latin text languages um, have the uh, text be horizontal if you can. Obviously, if you're talking about, um, you know, Chinese or other scripts and languages that read vertically, ignore that, right, reverse it. Um, but generally, try and have the text be the direction that people are going to be reading it in. It's more readable. Um, and also, and this is a huge one, especially for, you know, those, those pie charts and things that I was talking about, where the human brain has a really hard time estimating, you know, um, the actual values of the pieces of like the, the marks on the charts. You don't want to rely on legends. It's better to directly label your data whenever possible. And this is where I want to come back to this pie chart. If you imagine that these labels weren't here and they didn't say, you know, the chess pie is 2%, chocolate pie is 5%, there is no way that someone can look at this and estimate that there is actually um, a 3% difference between chocolate and lemon meringue, or a 1% difference between pecan and blueberry, right? The human brain just cannot, um, cannot do those kinds of calculations easily. So it's really important um, to directly label pie charts, but it's also good practice for other kinds of charts. You don't want to add additional clutter to charts, but if you can directly label, um, put the values um, on your charts rather than using legends, um, you just generally don't want to use a legend for a pie chart. You want to just be like, blue means apple or whatever, you know, because um, it's much more legible. And then finally, contrast is really important, right? So this is, um, this is true for uh, charts and texts that are appearing online or on screens, as well as in print. So you want to use, um, you want to use um, colors not only for the marks, you know, the actual data points or lines or whatever, um, but also the background um, for font colors, all of those different things that are, um, you know, that differ from each other on the light to dark spectrum. Um, and it's also useful if you can avoid using color as the only thing that tells someone um, information about a variable, right? You want to combine color with something like, if you have points, change the shape of the point, change the icon from a circle to a plus sign to a diamond. Um, you could use fill patterns on a bar chart for printing. If your colors are too similar, use fill patterns. You know, have some of the bars be, you know, like checkered, have some of them have like stripes, right? 
that will give people additional information to be able to visually distinguish between um, values. You could use size, labels, all different kinds of ways, but um, generally you want to avoid having color being the only thing that's, that's telling someone information. Um, and again, this is just to hammer, back, hammer home the contrast. Um, there are certain things that are you know, horrible. Like, I don't know who would do this, but um, even, even something like using white font or gray font on gray or white font on light gray, they're not different enough um, to make it um, easily readable for most people. So you wanna have high contrast whenever possible for all the colors um, and fonts and things in your data visualizations. Okay, so those are the four principles for maximizing accessibility. Um, I have a couple of recommendations in here. So there is something called the data visualization checklist, which comes in a PDF form as well as an interactive, you know, walk you through it on a website form, um, which has, you know, different principles you might want to follow for, you know, how your text appears, how marks and ticks and access labels appear, um, a really useful tool for just kind of um, best practices um, that, with too much detail to get into today. Um, there's also the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's guidelines for data visualization, um, which are really fantastic. Um, I believe the original website was just very recently migrated over to this kind of archived website on GitHub. Um, but you can go through here and look at, you know, for chart components, for color, um, how do you, you know, try and how do you make um, your data visualizations more accessible, um, a fantastic resource. Okay, and now let's go ahead and take, let's call it a five minute break. Um, at the top of the hour, since this is kind of a longer workshop. And then we'll come back at 11.05 Pacific time, so five minutes after the hour, wherever you are, um, to look at Data Wrapper. And we'll do a 20 minute demo, and I will also take a look through um, during the break, uh, Q&A, and I'll start to answer questions. Okay, it is 11.05, so we can go ahead and um, hop over into Data Wrapper. Before we did, I, I, I forgot to mention when we were looking at from data to viz, um, or I think I mentioned it, but we didn't look at it. Um, but um, in addition to the flow chart or decision tree, we're helping you choose the data um, chart type. Um, from Data to Viz also has different, um, they call them data stories. So, um, you know, for different kinds of combinations. So um, investigating relationships between, um, oh, they actually have empty cars in here. That's empty cars. Let's look and see what they do with empty cars. Um, so they talk about, you know, in investigating a data set like this that has a, a mix of numeric and categorical variables, right? You might want to um, and examine their distribution one by one, right? And they say, here are different charts that you could use for that. Um, we're going to do it with a histogram, right? Um, alternatively, you could do um, correlelograms. So they kind of just walk through different ways of investigating different kinds of data sets, um, showing you what different chart types look like. And all of these chart types have the R code. So there was a question about, you know, um, about R code. So if you wanted to um, find out, you know, what R library are they using to generate this heat map, which is interactive, which is very cool. Um, you can see that here, right? So it's a really, really useful resource, um, especially if you use R. Um, and um, they also have if we scroll down even further, again, we talked about pattern as a way to choose a chart type. So you can um, scroll all the way down on from the viz and they have a different, they kind of have a catalog essentially. So again, this is if you're just curious about what are some charts that can, you know, maybe be an alternate to the pie chart and showing me part to whole relationships. So here are a couple of different options. Um, and again, if you click into any of these, they're going to give you you know, caveats for when to use this, when not to use this. Um, some, some mistakes it's easy to make, um, et cetera. Um, and a lot of times um, there's overlap. So um, tree map is part to whole, but it also shows you hierarchy, ranking, et cetera. Just an all around pretty cool tool. Okay, so let's um, go over to Data Wrapper. So Data Wrapper is a free to use, um, it's actually a freemium because they, um, uh, it's a company in Berlin, Germany that um, creates, that has this um, online platform for creating data visualizations. And you can see um, some of the options for different kinds of charts 
that you can make in Data Wrapper here. You can make charts, tables, and maps. Um, and uh, they offer their platform for free. And then um, for, for example, uh, news outlets and journalists who want to pay for customized branding or features, um, then they offer a paid, a paid version of that. But I think it's really fantastic that they offer this tool um, for everyone for free to create um, interactive maps and charts. Um, and um, yep, so this, this slide just demonstrates um, again, that you can create different kinds of charts. So we have a, um, a bubble map. So it's basically a scatter plot that is, you know, on top of a map. And you can customize the tooltips that happen when you, that, that appear when you um, hover over different data points. Um, data wrapper charts are also responsive. And since I can't um, technically show this to you any other way, I have this slide about it. Um, so they're responsive in that um, no matter what kind of, um, if you create and host these charts using Data Wrapper, um, if someone's using a mobile device, the chart will scale. It will appear differently to them than to someone who's using, um, you know, a desktop, you know, um, laptop screen or whatever. So um, rather than just like scaling down the chart um, so that it's unreadable on mobile, they will, you know, you can see that the text is the same size. They've changed the axis down here um, so that it is responsive to mobile devices. So that can be a really useful feature. Um, so you can get to Data Wrapper um, at this link, which is also in the Google Doc. Um, and if you click on Start Creating, you can access their dashboard. So in this demo, we're basically going to just kind of walk through, look at some of the different features of this tool, how to use it, on how to get help. So they have this big um, question mark. This question mark will stay here for this. Anytime you're in this um, you know, app and you can click on that at any time to get um, to their help pages. So they have different tutorials. Um, if you want to just do a quick tour, they have how to make different kinds of bar charts. This is that article that I was referring to on um, selecting colors. So this is a great tool and it's right there at the question mark. So um, what I like most about this tool, as opposed to other online tools, tools for data visualization, um, well, there's a couple of things. But um, the first is that it makes it, they give you this workflow, right? They, it makes it easy to kind of go step by step, bring in data, um, make some changes to it, make sure it's being displayed the way you want it to, um, add annotations to it, you know, customize all kinds of text and stuff, and then you visualize it, and then you can get it out in a couple of different ways. So you can bring in data also in a couple of different ways. And right now I'm in the, um, the default, which is to create a new chart. You can also create maps and tables, which we're not gonna look at today. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to log in, but if you are logged in, you'll see, these are the charts that I've made um, in my account. So you can create a free account and that'll just help you keep track of your charts if you use this tool a lot. Um, but the very first thing you wanna do is get your data in somehow. So you can either copy and paste the data um, you can bring it in as, um, I'm going to do that, as a, an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV. Oops, well, I'll go back over here. Um, usually it lets you click on proceed before it moves. You can also bring in a Google spreadsheet or you can link to um, data sets, for example, if they live at a URL, um, you can bring them in. That way it's a bit more complicated, but it is possible. Um, and you can also just play around with some of their sample data sets. Um, and they even organize it by different kinds of charts that you could probably make with that data set. So you can kind of see here that we've brought in our, um, our Gapminder data with that information about countries. And then step two is check and describe, right? So something we did not talk about today but that is very important for data visualization is the process of preparing your data to visualize it, right? Getting it in the right format, um, which is called tidy data. And we're actually gonna do a poll um, before we wrap up at, up at the end today um, to ask you all about like, what are topics that you would maybe find useful in um, a future data biz workshop. And we could, um, we could absolutely do a, a, you know, part of a workshop on preparing data for analysis and for visualization, um, which Data transformation and transposition can be really complicated. Um, but what I like about Data Wrapper is that they kind of build some of that in here. Um, so my Gapminder data is already in a format that I want it in to visualize. My uh, variables are in individual columns. I only have one value per cell, and my observations are in rows. 
sometimes you'll get data that's, um, and in fact, um, a lot of penal and longitudinal data is like this. You'll have like a column like this with country, and then you'll have income per capita in 1900, 1901, 1902, 1903. And then you have all these, it's a very wide spreadsheet with lots of different columns of dates to actually visualize that you're going to want to transpose it so that um, we have a column for country, a column for year, and then just one column for the value. Um, Cause it's going to, that's kind of the format the old, most um, data viz programs are going to want that data in. And again, it's kind of hard to describe and imagine that. It's a very detailed kind of like topic we don't have time to get into, but this is the format that you're gonna want data in generally. If your data is not already in that format, you can try to use their data transposition tools. So they have, you can click down here, swap rows and columns. Um, so if your data is not showing up in a chart the way that you want it to, you can try seeing if swapping rows and columns helps. Um, so instead of having country as a column, we're going to have that as our um, column organizing. Um, I'm, I don't want that, so I'm going to switch back, but you can do that. There's also some like helpful text here, right? You can check or uncheck that your first row is a label. Um, you can change whether um, periods are, um, you know, decimal or thousand separators, depending on the language. Um, and um, you can also um, sort your table in here. You can search your table. Um, this is a kind of flexible screen to do some of that checking um, of your data, making sure it's being pulled in properly. Um, actually, numbers appear, different data types will appear as different colors here. So um, in fact, we should have some red cells. No, do we? Yeah, I think we do. Yeah, so we have some missing data, right? We don't have information on, um, on certain countries, certain variables. Um, and that'll show up as red. So it's just a useful place to kind of check your data. But once you're like, I'm good, I want to, um, I want to go ahead and visualize, you can again hit proceed and go to step three. And this is where the bulk of the visualization happens. So data wrapper is going to look at the data you brought in and arbitrarily pick some kind of chart to make for you. They've decided to plot all three of my um, numeric variables on one line chart using a single y axis, which means and again, it's all, um, it's all dynamic. So if you hover over one um, variable, we'll see that it's basically like this little line because the values are so low compared to population numbers in billions um, that it doesn't even appear on the chart. So this is not a great chart. Um, what we can do is again, um, using from data to viz or another chart picker, um, you can even just experiment, see what happens when you look at these different chart types for your particular data. Um, but I always do recommend uh, kind of thinking critically, like I, I want to make a scatter plot with this particular, I want to visualize these particular variables in this way, right? So I want to see what is the relationship again between income and they already kind of guessed that. I want to see income per capita by life expectancy. What is the relationship between um, average wealth, average country wealth and health outcomes? Um, so um, it automatically guessed that that's what I wanted to do. But in order to select which variables are getting displayed on which axis, you can go over here to refine. So within the visualized step, there are um, a number of other steps to take to kind of, you know, create your chart. So here on the refine tab, you have the ability to change which variables are being displayed on which axis. So that is very useful. Um, you can customize the range, you can customize the, your axes a little bit here. Um, you can customize how the, um, the chart uh, grid lines and labels are being um, displayed. So we could turn off, you know, off grid lines, turn on grid lines. Um, this is exactly the variable that I want on the uh, X axis. So I'm going to leave that, but I am going to change it to a logarithmic scale. Again, another topic we don't really have time to get into right now, but if you're comparing percentage change over time or across you know, different countries, you're probably not going to want to use a linear scale. And in fact, you can turn on the trend line down here and choose what method. So if we just did a linear, a linear trend line, this is not the most accurate way of visualizing the relationships between income per capita and life expectancy. So if I turn on the log scale, here's what happens. I'm going to want to turn off this 
Um, so I want this to be a log. Don't mind why. Oh, that's because I, I logged the vertical axis. I want to log the x-axis. So this is going to spread out the data a little bit more and allow us to kind of visualize the relationships a little bit easier. Um, I'm not sure why particular, I'm not sure why certain, um, certain countries are, like the labels are appearing. We can figure that out. Um, here's also where you're going to change color. So we have a variable um, for the region that a country is in that we can use to map to color. We could also map other, um, we could map country, but again, that's gonna give us like 200 different colors, right? Not useful. Four regions is just four colors. Um, and nothing is gonna happen right away because you're gonna need to customize those colors. So we can select a color. And again, um, you can, you probably want to do your color palette or scale selection in another place, another tool like Viz Wrapper, Viz, sorry, Viz Palette, um, and then bring that color in here, right? So um, you can select a color, you again can choose the hex value for the colors so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use colors that um, kind of look visually different. They might not be the best, but we can double check. There is a built-in um, color vision checker here. So we can kind of get a sense of whether our reds and our greens are really too similar for folks with red green color blindness. So I'm going to leave, I'll oh, leave Asia as blue. Europe can be another color. Um, Africa, well, yeah, let's see. Um, I don't want to pick colors that are too, um, too close to each other. So this, they look fairly different. Um, let's double check. There is this color blindness. Um, and again, it's not a checker. It's going to just simulate um, what these colors look like. But if the colors are too similar, there will be a little, um, a little, a little red triangle kind of like warning arrow that's like, maybe this is not the best color palette for, you know, this particular um, type of color vision, um, and again, they also include blue, um, sorry, blue yellow, not blue green, um, color blindness. Less common, but um, really problematic for seeing certain colors. You can also map um, size to different variables and map shapes. This is where I talked about, you don't just want to use color if you can help it. Um, you also want to use another, um, another variable, but it's also, there's a balance between being clear and um, you know, not overly cluttering a graph so that that actually brings down the clarity. Even if you're trying to make it more clear by adding shape or, palette or um, pattern or things like that. So I do want to actually map size, the size of each circle. We have a third um, numeric variable in this data set, we have population. So we can make the size of the circles reflect population so that larger countries um, appear as larger circles. And we can change the maximum size so that the circles are just a little bit easier to see. So now it's really obvious kind of like which countries are the larger countries, where they are. Um, cool. And let's see, have we done everything we want? No. We want to go over to annotate and, and give a chart title, right? So a good um, chart title is going to include things like um, the, the, the things that you're plotting, right? So um, this is income per capita. Um, you'll definitely want to mention um, uh, units of measurement at some point somewhere in description or in your chart title, income per capita um, related to, this is not the best example of life expectancy. Honestly, the best title for this chart oops, wow, I can spell, um, would be um, something like, what is the takeaway from this chart? that um, health outcomes are closely tied to, um, you know, different variables, income, you know, um, things like that. You can add a description for your chart that will appear right below. Um, you can, and in fact, you really, really should always um, cite your data sources. So you can um, include that. You can include a link to the data source and that will appear down here in the little footer. You can add your name in the byline. Um, you can, um, what's really cool, well, you can customize the tooltip. This is very important. Um, so when you hover over this, if I wanted additional information, and you'll notice when I clicked on that, it filtered by region, it filtered by color. 
Um, so you can kind of customize all of this interactivity. So you can, um, you can edit the tooltip by, if I wanted to have like population appear, right? So now when I hover over a country, it's gonna give me that value. And you can actually say like, you can add the text in that's like, um, population. So you can customize this tooltip, which is really useful. Um, you can also add custom annotations. So if you wanted to like add some text here, you know, to point out some interesting information about something, right? Um, you can just go ahead and click wherever you want it to appear. And it will appear and you can edit it, you can move it around. Um, so the annotation capabilities of this, again, because it's kind of created with data journalism in mind, are really powerful. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click proceed so we can show how you can um, export your charts and publish them. Oh, I didn't click design because design doesn't really do anything. It just gives you that option to um, change the thousand separators again. So I'm going to click publish. And um, by default, um, your charts are available online, but they're not going to show up any in any aggregators or anything like that. They're not going to be public in the sense that it's easy for people to find them um, unless you choose to do that. So they're not, um, if you click publish, right, it's going to be public in the sense that um, you can embed it somewhere and it will be available. Um, but you can also keep charts private. You don't have to publish them. You can just create them for yourselves. So you can, um, you can um, create copies, right, if you want to make alternate versions of this chart or do the same thing to different data. Um, you can also get them out as static images. So you can um, choose what size you want your image to be, um, customize it a bit, right, um, and then you can download it. Again, that won't have the interactivity, so you'll want to, to make sure it's appearing the way that you want it to appear um, before you do this. But if we want to publish it, we can go ahead and click publish. It's going to tell us, all right, we are getting it ready to be hosted. And then you can either share it with this um, URL. So if you shared this chart using the URL, this is how it would appear. And again, if I, um, if I change the size of my window, it's going to rescale the chart because it's responsive, rather than making the text, you know, really small or unreadable, it will still be readable no matter what size screen someone's viewing your chart on. Um, and you can also embed it as an iframe, as a responsive iframe in, you know, your WordPress site or your blog or wherever. Okay, questions about Data Wrapper. I'm seeing a question about similar resources for Python. Um, do you mean um, similar resources in terms of like creating um, color palettes and things? The um, from data to viz resources um, link out to Python Python chart galleries. Um, so if we go back to um, from data to viz. For any of the charts in here, you can get Python code for them, I believe. Yeah. You can also get JavaScript code if you're using like D3JS or another JavaScript library. Yep, from data to viz. Yep, yep. Um, so it's, yeah, so the website from data to viz itself. Um, all the charts that you see on it were generated with R and like their data stories focus on R code, but they will link out for each of the chart types to the Python graph gallery, which will give you additional resources for, you know, um, which Python packages you can use to generate that kind of chart. So that's an additional resource for Python. There's, yeah, and JavaScript. Um, it, okay, long versus wide data setup. Um, what, um, what is the, uh, could you uh, reframe the question a little bit about the long versus wide? Are you curious about um, data wrapper in particular or just general um, preparing data for visualization? 
ah, transposing, yes. Transposing is just um, changing from wide to long data. Yes. And if that would be useful, okay, actually we have, before, before y'all hop off the call, I have some polls. Um, so um, it should pop up on your screen now. Um, so if there are topics, for example, um, that question of like, how do you transpose tidy, you know, how do you create tidy data? How do you prepare your data for plotting and transpose from wide to long? Um, would you be interested in seeing that kind of topic in a future data biz workshop? It'd be fantastic to hear about that as well as any of these other topics. And we'll leave this up for a, a little bit so folks can read and respond. And then the second question is um, so that, you know, if I offer something similar on, uh, like to another data, intro to data viz workshop, if these topics were useful and which ones you would like to, um, you know, you would recommend keeping or changing or what parts were most helpful about this workshop. Yeah. I generally include something about tidy data and an explanation about wide and long um, in an intro to data viz workshop, but there was just so much I wanted to talk about today in terms of color. Um, yeah, because I feel like color, is, color and chart type are the, the really big kind of sticky sticky pieces when you're first getting started and learning new chart types, like, you know, where do I even start? How do I decide? All right, I'm still seeing responses trickling in. Um, and I also, there is a link to a follow-up survey. It would, should just take like one minute to fill out, but it would be helpful for research services in the library to know um, what, you know, again, what you found most helpful about this workshop. So as we offer future workshops in this Working with Data series, um, that we could um, refine, you know, what we're offering. So Margarita just shared the link to the post-workshop survey in the chat. It's also linked in our Google Doc. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Thank you all for um, folks who shared, and I will share the results. So it looks like 60% um, would find it helpful for us to do some kind of um, preparing data for visualization um, workshop. Um, I'll mention, so Kat Kozier, our data librarian, um, she was just, she just offered a, earlier in this working with data series, um, actually last week, a workshop on data organization that covers some of this, not all of this, um, but we can also, she's planning, or we're both planning on um, offering this series again in either the fall or the winter, so we will definitely, um, I will look at incorporating tidy data and that data preparation transposition um, material in a future workshop. Yes, I believe it's recorded. She might have only recorded it for sharing um, with participants, so folks who registered for it, I can check with her. Um, but we have a um, UCR library YouTube. And we have, um, since we've gone remote, um, we have, um, been recording most of our workshops in research services and making those available on a playlist. And I know we're over time, so if folks have to hop off. I totally understand. Just want to kind of point out this, this one last resource. Um, so we have playlists um, for different things. Um, workshops is one of them. All the playlists. There it is. So we have a playlist of all of our recorded workshops, and this one will appear here. Um, so once we have this um, data viz workshop all um, edited and wrapped up. We'll put it up here and I'll double check with Kat on um, whether um, some of those workshops might be available as well. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for participating. Let me open up those polls again. I want to see. Yes. So the choosing a chart type was helpful, very helpful to know. Um, thank you all for uh, participating and um, I look forward to seeing you in other workshops. So thank you all. <laughs>